Hi, I'm Phil Hunter of Citrus Grove Lutheran Church in Wesley Chapel. I'm appreciative that you took the chance to tune in here. This is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to learn a little bit more about a piece of the Bible. It's something that we're going to do every time we gather. That's where our, our, our faith gets stronger. That's where we find what we need to know about eternal life. And that's how salvation passes our way. Um, let's take a little moment to, to uh, prepare our hearts with a prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you, you, O triune God, are the only one who can bring life from death and can extend this life into eternity with you. So we ask for your presence today as we study your word, hear its truth, and listen to the, the voice of, of freedom and of triumph and victory over sin and over death that, uh, that you sound out, Lord Jesus. So bless your people with an increased reliance on you and keep us from relying on ourselves or our possessions for getting us through the, the toughest parts of life. We uh, ask you to do this, trusting in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, the uh, place where we are is Luke chapter 19. We've been in Luke 9 for a while, so you're going to have to skip a little bit farther ahead. And uh, we're going to go from there through the end of the book now with no skips. And that'll take us through, uh, through the end of May for sure. Uh, this summer, then, we'll skip... We'll go back over the, the parts that we skipped, chapter 10 through uh, 18, I guess. So that's a little roadmap for where we're going. I'd like you to think about those uh, people in a prison camp or uh, a concentration camp at the end of World War II when the Allies were going through and, and liberating those prison camps. To be a, a survivor who is inside the gates, inside the fence or the wall, and, and to, to hear the voices of, you know, uh, allied troops and to, to see your, your enemies captured or, or watch them run away and, and to see the faces of people coming to help and the sound of friends. Just imagine the, the emotions going through, uh, through you and the, the memories that would stick with you your, your whole life. These people are bringing you freedom. They're getting you out of a, a hellish jail. And that's something that would, would inspire and just stick with absolutely anyone. It would move something in your heart so that you jump up and you shout for joy when salvation, rescue, comes your way. Whatever it may be that you're being set free from, it doesn't have to be a prison camp, it can be anything. It's the sign of a, of a healthy Christian heart that you recognize, oh, I need rescue and I have received rescue, salvation. And so you do, you too also uh, are rejoicing and you can't really ever get over the day that salvation came to your house, to you too. There are two characters in the Bible who are going to kind of rekindle in us today that, that joy of being set free. They're Jesus and Zacchaeus. We read about Zacchaeus only in one spot in the Bible. That's Luke 19, the first 10 verses. So um, I'll read a, a bit of that, and then we'll talk about it. And we'll go through those 10 verses there you have in Luke 10, Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. This is the day that salvation came to Zacchaeus' house. And maybe it started as the typical day for a chief tax collector. There's always some more money to be gotten out of the people, you know, except something today interrupted the regular flow of business. There's a visitor in town. You know, everyone was coming out of their houses, out of the shops, and gathering in the streets to see a man whose reputation preceded him. Jesus of Nazareth, the, the rabbi or teacher who had been stirring the pot for a couple of years now, and who had healed thousands of people and taught tens of thousands and gathered supporters and opponents everywhere across the country. 
Uh, some towns turned him away, threw him out. Others had embraced him, hosted him multiple times. And now it was Jericho's turn to host Jesus. And the crowds were out in full force. Some fans, some enemies, some folks still on the fence. People, maybe like Zacchaeus, who had certainly heard about Jesus, heard bits and pieces of his teachings and had uh, his miracles too. They were curious about him, but they didn't have an obvious in uh, connection with him. What possible connection would there be between a famous religious scholar, teacher, and a tax collector who had made big bucks selling out his neighbors as an agent of the Roman government, squeezing them for the money that was due to the state, but getting to keep any extra he squeezed out of them as a bonus. Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus. Now he wanted to hear Jesus for himself. So he found a sturdy tree, shimmied up, and got as comfy as you can get in a tree so that this man, who nobody liked, could see the teacher that everyone was following. Zacchaeus didn't have a shred of dignity left with uh, the people in his city anyways, so uh, he had cheated them and badgered them, and no love was lost between him and them. So what did he care if they saw him up in a tree and made fun of him? In fact, they were probably just glad he was up there and not standing next to any one of them. There were actually two reasons for concern about Zacchaeus, the person of Zacchaeus. One, I mentioned, the people, especially the most religious people, were concerned about Zacchaeus because they didn't like him or what he was doing. He, his job was to be the king of the thieves in their town, as far as they were concerned. And he worked for the foreign government that was occupying their country. The most effective way they could think of to show him that they didn't like him was to ostracize him, cut him off from society, give him the silent treatment. You know, he can keep going, he can do his job, make his bucks, but everyone else made clear, you have no social life, you have no approval from any of us. Jesus, it seems, was less worried about Zacchaeus for those reasons, like uh, John, in the ba John the Baptist who had preached before Jesus. The gospel message was going to resonate with people at all rungs of society, across every culture, and, and with people with all different kinds of jobs. It still does to this day. And in most cases, Jesus doesn't call us to leave our current line of work. He didn't teach soldiers to stop being soldiers, but to be Christian soldiers. And it was even possible to be a Christian tax collector, which is something Jesus knew, but the crowd in Jericho and even Zacchaeus himself might not have been able to picture that that was possible. So if it didn't bother Jesus that Zacchaeus collected taxes for a living, why might he have been particularly concerned for this man's soul? Well, it was because he was wealthy. Like we just heard, he was a wealthy man. And unlike preachers of the prosperity gospel, Jesus never talks about money as a sign that you're on God's good side. Actually, he was always warning his followers not to fall into the temptingly simple trap that rich people are good and poor people are bad. Jesus stressed how treacherous the blessing of a lot of financial blessings can be. With just a minute of thought, you can probably guess why wealth, being a wealthy person, might be confusing spiritually, might cause you to mix things up spiritually. It's because as a, a wealthy person, you can hardly stop yourself from having two dangerous feelings or bouncing between them. One is, I have enough stuff, so I'm good. I don't need anyone else. I certainly don't need to be rescued or saved. I can literally buy my own happiness. Or the other uh, trap would be to say, you know, I have lots, but someone else has more. I still don't have enough. As much as I have, I wish I had even that much more. That's a trap that anybody can, can fall into. But can you see why Jesus said it's literally like threading a needle? To have tons of wealth, but still be content with what God has given you and be mindful that it could all be gone tomorrow and still appreciate your treasure in heaven even more than your considerable treasures here on earth. Could you do all that? Keep it straight? <laughs> it's a super hard needle to thread, especially if, like Jesus said, you're trying to thread a camel through that needle. It just could not be done. 
without some kind of miracle. Up to this point in Luke's gospel, uh, rich people really don't look very good. From a, a rich ruler who walked away from Jesus rather than give his possessions to the poor, to a parable about a, a rich fool who thought he had everything he needed but lost track of the, the time that was in God's hands. A story about a rich man in hell begging poor Lazarus to come down from heaven, give him some water. And Jesus also had harsh words for Pharisees who were wealthy people themselves. And they were bickering with each other over who deserved higher honor. But here, after all those bad examples of wealth blinding the eyes of sinners in need of a savior, here comes a good example. And what it took was a rich man who was coming to grips with the fact that his heart was not healthy. That maybe there was more to life than the money he'd bilked out of his neighbors. He didn't exactly know what he was missing, but he knew there must be something better, something longer lasting, something more satisfying. And his hunch was right, but only Jesus had the answers that Zacchaeus knew deep down he was missing. Only Jesus could save him from this emptiness and confusion and despair. And by the way, this is so true for many people who live in our Wesley Chapel area, that there is more to life than a comfy house in a nice development in Florida. There really is. Hearts don't get healthy without Jesus. So good thing Jesus comes to town to do what no amount of money can do. Heal hearts. Verse 5 of Luke 19 says, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to, the, to be the guest of a sinner. There's one word in there that I am totally fascinated with. Jesus said, I must stay at your house. If you were unfamiliar with Jesus, that might sound like just a rather rude way of inviting yourself over to someone's house. But really, Jesus is choosy about when he uses that word, must. He doesn't let just anyone tell him what he has to do. In fact, there's only one person who tells him what he has to do. Every time that Jesus says he must do something, it's to complete a part of the plan that God his Father sent him to earth to do. I must go to Jerusalem. I, I must be handed over. I must be put to death and on the third day rise from the dead. God had promised through his prophets that the Messiah would do all those things. So Jesus, as the Messiah, had to do them. He must. Except listed among those great earth-shaking sh acts of salvation is another one that seems small in comparison. Zacchaeus, I must go to your house today. We need to sit down and talk. I need to stay with you. And you and I will have an honest conversation, a chat over dinner. And who cares what all your neighbors say about you? I must tell you what I think, what my father thinks about you. And tell you, you've never seen a nut fall from a tree faster than Zacchaeus scurried down and welcomed him gladly. In John chapter 10, Jesus talks about himself as the good shepherd. And there he says, I have other sheep more sheep who aren't currently in my flock, and I must bring them into my fold too, so that they listen to my voice and they know they're part of my flock and know that I am their shepherd too. Well, Zacchaeus is one such outcast sheep. And Jesus was his good shepherd. So while the rest of the town was appalled that Jesus would waste his time with a man like that, dirty his reputation by associating with people like that who burned through their goodwill and and their second and third and more chances in society, Jesus was busy teaching one straying sheep about the fresh start that he never thought he would get. Or to put it in the words that a tax collector would understand, salvation means that God's ledger shows Zacchaeus' many sins have been wiped away, debts fully paid, plus a mountain of surplus on top, grace upon grace, all given by some mysterious donor. Jesus. He excluded the judgment of the city of Jericho. He brought Zacchaeus' spiritual standing back into proper perspective. This is between you and me, you and God. You may have ruined a reputation. You 
friend may have wasted you know some opportunity you may be trapped by some addiction you might be locked up in jail you may have fallen into traps that come with having time and money you may have forgotten that there's more to life in any case in any situation your standing before god is between you and him not what somebody else thinks so no matter what they say no matter what they think you and god need to talk it's between you and god you must be on good terms with him ready for the good news god has done the work of coming to you coming to your town passing your way maybe he used parents or friends or a spouse to bring you to hear what he has to say maybe you uh, came to a camp or maybe you were dragged into an easter service or, or maybe you tuned in online but once you got close enough to, to hear what he is saying, you heard Jesus telling you that everything has been accomplished. You know, that is a news that kind of lifts regret that weighs you down. And it puts it, all the load on somebody else, onto Jesus, the friend of sinners. He's the friend of, of all people. It just so happens that the outcasts and the rejects and the obvious sinners are often the ones who acknowledge they don't have any other good friends on their side. So they appreciate having a good shepherd as their friend. You know, the story could have ended there with Jesus in Zacchaeus' house, the good news changing his heart. But the story never really ends there. As members of Citrus Grove Lutheran Church, you know there's more to it. Healthy hearts lead to what? It's in all of our <laughs> brochures, all of our bulletins, all of our websites and everything. Healthy hearts lead to fruitful lives. Healthy hearts, fruitful lives. That's just the, the way it goes in the kingdom of God. A, but a heart, of course, only becomes a healthy heart by encountering Jesus and Jesus' grace. Jesus pumps life into dead souls and he wakes you up and he washes you clean and he energizes you. Not just for the fun of doing that, but so that you go and you live for him. You're saved so that you are saved for a purpose. To go live in ways that are fruitful, beneficial, productive. Zacchaeus grasped that really quickly. You know, we don't know how much guidance Jesus gave him toward what kinds of fruitful living in particular would be best suited for a man like him. Maybe Jesus didn't have to guide him at all, but... Zacchaeus responds to Jesus' grace by stating his own kind of good fruit, the kind of fruit that came naturally to, to his new faith. Verse 8 says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus is going to get the last word here. And it could be seen as a rival to John 3.16, as the gospel in a nutshell. It's a succinct summary of what Jesus is all about. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man, talking about himself, came to seek and to save the lost. Friend, rekindle the appreciation. Like the first time you heard the gospel, like the the appreciation for, for being brought into God's kingdom and his family by baptism, even if you don't remember that, appreciate it. Who else would move heaven and earth to save you from troubles that you couldn't even see? What greater gift is there for a, a lost soul in eternal danger than for a loving, powerful God to seek after you and to save you by paying whatever it costs? And and then giving that lost soul a family and the dignity of being found and freed for a purpose, for a fruitful life. Zacchaeus never forgot the day when salvation arrived into town and even came to his house. You too, consider it your greatest treasure that Jesus passed your way. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You can give an offering using the link in the description below this video. There are some hymns you can sing there, an invitation to our weekly Bible study on Wednesday nights. It's an online one, so you don't have to commute. You can just click in and you're part of the group. I uh, hope you can join us uh, there or in person for worship next weekend at Pinecrest Academy on Highway 54, 930 on Sundays. That's the time. Put it on your calendar also for Good Friday coming up. That's uh, uh, going to be a, a 1 p.m. on that Friday afternoon. And then Easter Sunday will be a 930 service like normal with a um, brunch to follow. So if you'd like more information about that, uh, you can email me, use the contact information below there. Or you'll find a sign-up sheet when you're able to join us in person. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.